That was his main thing that he wanted to do in the live room. So we had to make the room very, very reverberant. So all these curves, we took off the fabric and the insulation and put very thin plywood on it. And whenever you bend very thin plywood, two things happen. You get a membrane absorber, because there's a, me a thin membrane with air behind it, and you get a polycylindrical, a convex polycylindrical. By definition, any convex surface is a scattering element, because if you, if you take a convex shape, it's really, that smooth curve is really an infinite number of slightly changing surfaces. So any convex surface but is a very, very uh, affordable and easy way to make a, uh, a scattering element in a room. And that's exactly what that was. This, I think, more typically, this is the back of this little house that's a commercial building, even though it looks like a house. And this is Alicia Key's studio. This one, I believe, really talks to what I think is more going to happen. And I can tell you from experience, we've gotten about 10 studio projects just from other artists walking into this and saying, that's what I want. I want one of these studios. It fits a characteristic that I learned from Bucky Fuller. Got to study with him in the late 60s before he died. And uh, he used the term over and over again called the bare maximum. Not the bare minimum, the bare maximum. Not, I wish it was my term, but it's not. And you can figure out what it means. It's a little tongue te teaser that more or less means exactly what we need. Not too big, not too small. So for Alicia, there's no money problems. She got plenty of money. Money was not the issue. This is all she needs. Let's take a look at, the, at what this really looks. These rooms are not that big. Very exciting, okay? All the low frequency control is behind these guys. And this here, although it looks like it's just stretched fabric, is actually very thin curved plywood with a little bit of insulation in front of it because it's a concave shape. And then we covered it with fabric because she just wanted to. These are slot resonators. These are thin strips of wood that look like mini diffusers that are then put next to each other with tiny spaces. So the spaces actually make it behave like a resonator. So it's a high frequency diffuser and a low frequency absorber. That's another way to absorb sound is by creating a resonator, either with slots or with perfs, with, with, with perforated holes. I'm always on the lookout for surfaces that absorb low frequency and scatter high frequencies. It's easy to absorb high frequencies. It's hard to absorb low frequencies without absorbing high frequencies. So always on the lookout for those kinds of surfaces. And of course, Alicia's one requirement here was that she didn't want to sing in a sponge. We got the same thing now uh, for a project with Celine Dion. Same thing. I mean, these are singers. They don't want to sing in a sponge. They want to sing in a reverberant space. They want to hear themselves, OK? Um, First AWS in New York, that's this new, of course everybody knows what that is, the duality grew out of the AWS, and I like these consoles. I think this is the future, it's the present actually, but uh, I think these are really very, very cool solutions, these kind of hybrid consoles. They're analog and they're digital controllers in the same box. Very efficient, extremely affordable, very compact. They don't need a power supply, they plug right into a wall. Um, very cool, I believe this is really the way to go. So you're starting your session in analog, getting all the charm and the warmth of analog, but then getting the, you know, the, the horsepower, uh, and the, this, particularly the editing horsepower in the digital domain. Do you okay. find a compromise that keeps the singer happy with enough of this movement? <clears throat> well, okay, the, yeah, we're treading, now yeah, we're really on a slippery slope here. Um, I don't want you to leave the room thinking that, okay, we'll just design a perfect room and then we don't need any other skills. I mean, we still need microphone placement. We still need rooms to be able to change and be flexible. We're going to see some of those, okay? This is a room that did not have variable acoustics. In a sense, this was not that hard a room for us to conceive because we knew exactly what wanted to happen in here. 99% of the time, this is Alicia singing or playing piano. It's her private studio. Strangely enough, they've rent, they, have, they don't rent it out. She, I mean, they could rent it out. People want to use it all the time. She just doesn't want to rent it out, doesn't need the money. Um, lots of other artists have used it. We do have two other vocal booths that are dry. One's, one's very dead and one's almost dead. But her requirements in this room were very, very specific. Okay, I want a reverberant room, no flutter echoes, no harsh anomaly, anomalous uh, reflections, et cetera, et cetera, that that really rings and stays true all through the frequency range. 
Obviously, for singing, she's not too concerned about 60 hertz, but for the piano, she is. Okay, so when they, they, they this is not the piano they use. This is a horrible sound. This is the piano. I think they use it on the tour. Actually, I don't even think they use it on the tour. Yamaha gave it to her. It's a tour piano, but in, in the studio, they use, actually, they, they use a Yamaha, but they use a, a traditional baby grand. And um, she needs to hear it. She wants to hear it. She, so often, she's recording without phones. She wants to hear the room. It's, it's just the way she wants to work. Um, if this was more of a multi-purpose studio that had to get really, really dry, like maybe it was an all-purpose studio in a secondary market, then maybe on the wall we would have curtains that draw or panels that open and close so that we could deaden the room quite a bit. I have seen them get this room dead. They basically just bring in throw rugs and bring in gobos. Sometimes they bring in two couches. It never looks like this. None of these studios actually ever look like this. They, they don't really look like this on a day-to-day -day basis. When, when they're using them, it's, it's tricked out. They make them, that's the whole point. That's the whole point of studios. They're, they're supposed to be controlled by the artist. Um, just shifting, we send you lots of pictures here. This is a production studio in Milan, Italy. They are supposed to come in any shape and color that you can imagine. Only some Italians would dream this up, I imagine. And uh, there's a skylight. Who would think of having a skylight right overhead in a mixing position? But that's what they wanted. They wanted to have daylight for a lot of their sessions. Turned out to not be that big a deal. Just put the glass at an angle, make sure the reflection is headed in a direction that we want it and then absorb it. So it wasn't that big a deal. To a tiny little studio. Pay attention to this one. Look how small this is. This is two, believe it or not, film mixing rooms. Obviously not Dolby approved because they're not big enough, but they have the X curve. They sound every good, I mean, basically, when they're done with a project, they have to send it uptown to a Dolby room just for one pass, just to get the, the stamp on it. But no one ever does any work on it because they're not going to get a Dolby cert with this tiny room. A shared vocal booth which has four Foley pits, tiny little bathroom, tiny little machine room, scunchy little kitchen here, and the fire escape, they even stole that and put some plants in it and a barbecue. All of this is 750 square feet. These are two production rooms that run simultaneously at the same time in 750 square feet. The control room for that mountaintop studio was 750 square feet. So we have two complete extremes here. They're both interesting to me. I'm both proud of them that we worked on them. This is the future. This is what's going on, this kind of stuff. You would not be able to build this room. I, I, we can't even photograph the room. It's too small. You could not get, and this is a 5-1 room, you could not get this room to work without active low-frequency absorption. There's one company that makes an active low-frequency absorber bag end. It's called the E-Trap. See a few heads. The room would, we, we tried every trick in the book. We, we didn't even have four inches on the walls. We've got two E-traps. As a matter of fact, the first studio to use the E-trap was Ovasan, which is the name of the studio. And it does work. It requires electricity. It's tricky to set. It went out once in the middle of a session. We had to reset it, or they had to reset it. But it does work. An active, low-frequency absorber. Who would have thought? Didn't even exist five years ago. Didn't even exist two years ago. This is cool stuff. This is really, really, this is what makes it fun. For me, this is why I keep doing it. Yeah? I've noticed in almost every photograph of the control room so far, <coughs> mm -hmm. I've seen large mains, soffit mounted mains monitors. Um, do you think that large mains are a part of the future of the recording studio? No, you're about to see the same number of, this doesn't have large mains. These actually have some small Genelex behind the screen. Um, I happen to show you back-to-back-to-back -to -back -to -back studios that kind of have hip-hop urban recording, of which the Augsburger speaker is the speaker of choice. Um, and they kind of more or less get mounted the same way. We're very familiar with them. Um, but I think before we're done, you're going to see, no, I don't think that's the future at all. No, small rooms is the future. Small rooms using very creative low frequency control and using really cool small equipment is the future. 